Okay, um, we're ready to begin again. We're running late, so let's just uh, start as quickly as possible. This section on groups and individuals and fairness. Um, we'll begin with Cynthia Dwork. So this is very much work in progress. Um, so, uh, Mike. In April, I stood up here and I gave a talk with the same starting slide, but there has been progress made. So it's, it's good to know. Okay. Um, great. So you've heard a lot in the last couple of days about individualist versus groups versus structures and so on. In the literature on the theory of algorithmic fairness, there are two broad categories of definitions. One is indeed very broad, and that's the uh, category of group fairness definitions. And then there's a smaller category of individual fairness. So group fairness examples from the computer science literature would be something like this, a statistical parity or demographic parity. It says, let's say if you're looking at college admissions, that the demographics of students that are accepted to your college are the same as the demographics of the population as a whole. And another uh, example might be balance for the positive class. Among those with credit scores above some threshold value T, the probability of receiving a loan is the same for the members of the minority group as for members of the majority group. So among qualified candidates for the loan, the probability should be the same. So there are many ways, this is a very reductive statement, but basically there are many ways in which group notions fail. And so here are a few examples. Statistical parity might sound nice, but you can twist things. So for those of you who were here when Evelyn Hammonds asked, what do theoretical computer scientists do? And I said, well, we think about these problems from an adversarial perspective, and we try to imagine an adversary who is as nasty and twisty and devious as possible. And, and we see what are the goals of this horrible adversary, and then we try to rule them out. So if you think that statistical parity will take care of, your, uh, of, your, of an advertiser who doesn't wish to advertise the steakhouse to members of the minority group, well, um, we can have them advertise proportionately to both groups, but among the minorities, they send the ads to the vegetarians, people who would not be interested in the service. So clearly, it's discriminatory, but it satisfies this sort of demographic parity constraint. Um, for the, uh, the loan example, you might have very, distribution, very different distributions of how you allocate the loans um, for the people who are above thresholds. So for example, you may choose to, to, to give the loans to the assimilationists, to the people who look as much like the majority as possible and meet these statistical requirements. So I'm just saying that these broad brushes are not, are not expressive enough. And then you have other questions. Which groups do you want to consider? Um, and you necessarily, you shouldn't necessarily be relying on the members of, of an oppressed group to notice even necessarily that their treatment is unfair. They have to realize that there's this work by, by Mazarin Banerjee, Banerjee, and I'm sorry, I forgot the collaborator, which talks about how, how oppressed groups uh, take, uh, in, um, adopt the beliefs of the oppressing group. So we don't want to have to uh, uh, force everybody always to be standing up for themselves. And what about the intersectional case? How do you define the problem for the intersectional case 
there are a lot of intersections, but also it's not even clear what does affirmative action mean in the intersectional case. We can come up with examples where it's not clear what you want to do, even if you have a general notion of what affirmative action should be. Uh, sorry, that was my next bullet. Okay. And another thing is that these, these, these uh, statistical uh, requirements are surprisingly hard to test or surprisingly hard to test meaningfully. And um, uh, an example of a paper about this is a very recent work by Neil and Winship who argue that standard benchmark and outcomes tests typically produce invalid inferences that, in their words, may diverge from reality in either direction indicating discrimination when it is not present, or alternatively indicating a lack of discrimination when it is present. So just to emphasize, it's, it's not even clear what the statistical conditions mean when they are satisfied or when they are not satisfied. So this is why I say very reductively, group notions fall under scrutiny. So this led us to suggest a long time ago individual fairness. So individual fairness says, roughly speaking, that people who are similar with respect to a given classification task should be treated similarly by classifiers for that task. So if we're trying to classify people in terms of whether we should send them an advertisement about a book a certain kind of book. Well, people who have similar interests, perhaps reading interests, should be treated similarly. Um, hair products could be a completely different story. So people who are similar with respect to their reading interests may be wildly different with respect to their hair products. And there's no reason for an advertiser who's going to be advertising a hair product to treat people with similar reading interests similarly. Um, OK, so and and and. While some legal scholars think that group conditions are meaningful under certain circumstances, there seems to be uh, a more pervasive notion in law that similarly situated people should be treated similarly. So this framework is very powerful, but um, it requires that metric, that notion of how similar a pair of people is, every pair of people perhaps is for the given classification task. And we don't know where do we get that metric from. And so that sort of brought that line of research a little bit to a halt. Um, so individual fairness requires a task-specific metric. On the other hand, very recent work by uh, my student, Christina Ilvento, shows how given access to a fair adjudicator or an arbiter, and that could be a human or it could be some incredibly carefully trained device, you can, with a surprisingly small number of queries um, uh, to, this, to this arbiter, get a good approximation to the metric or, um, yes, okay. Now, the, the notion of similarly treated people, similar people being treated similarly is, um, uh, it's very appealing intuitively, and it also doesn't require the similarity metric to actually make any value judgments about individuals. It doesn't have to say how exactly how qualified somebody is. Just it just has to understand something about how similar they are, and so that that can be useful um, uh, for allowing this metric not to sort of force certain behaviors on algorithms that may have different tasks but need the same similarity information. And in particular, it allows us to avoid having to, uh, under, to, to create scores. That is, the fairness part doesn't have to create scores. Now, Let's talk about risk scores. So scoring functions, they assign scores to people, but they often, those scores are often interpreted as probabilities. So in fact, you can rescale the scores so that the individuals are always given a score between zero and one, and people tend to treat these as probabilities. So what's the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow? 
a 30% chance of rain, 18%, 20% chance of rain. You're used to seeing things like that. And that, you could think of that as a scoring function that maybe takes into account the weather today and yesterday and maybe what it was like last year or typically at this time of year, what's coming uh, on the jet stream across the Pacific and so on and make a prediction. Or for a given person P, what's the probability that P will rep repay a loan? So you get a number between zero and one probability. Or we have a tumor. What's the probability if we follow a particular medical course of treatment that this tumor will metastasize? And of course, very poignantly, what is the probability that this individual will commit a violent crime? And this is a predictor that is used in trying to decide whether you should uh, keep someone in jail or let them out on parole. So, What's the probability, though, of a non-repeatable event? So if you're a cryptographer, you say, OK, the, there's some, let's say in the loan case, OK, people have some internal randomness. They interact with the environment. The vi environment has its own randomness. And the probability space is over the joint probability distribution of these, the random coins of the individual and the environment. But outside the filter bubble of cryptography, you don't really have people necessarily believing in these things. Is there randomness in whether it's going to rain tomorrow, or we just can't quite figure out whether it's going to rain? Is there randomness inside the tumor and the way the tumor interacts with the body, or do we just not, under, not have the, the, the capacity to take in all of the information and compute from it? Um, and of course, is there randomness in whether this person is going to commit a violent uh, act in the next couple of years? Or is, is everything already determined? What is the meaning? You can't give a loan and then see what happens and then rewind and give a loan again and see what happens and say, yes, in 30% of these lifetimes, this person repaid. So what is the meaning of probability in these cases? So just to like. Uh, get you a little bit of intuition, let's think about the tumor ex example. So we have this tumor. The tumor, um, it has, let's say, certain uh, genomic uh, markers on it. So maybe we have a study where we look at a bunch of tumors that have those markers, and we say in 70% of the cases there was metastasis. So OK, so maybe that. Maybe what the doctor says here is, yeah, it's 70%. But what if there's another study that may even look at other features, and it turns out that your tumor has these other features, and of a study that only looked at those other features, 40% metastasized. So what's now your thinking about the probability that this tumor is going to metastasize? Is it lower than 70%? Um, do you say, oh, wow, there are, there are bad markers of two kinds. Is it bigger than 70%? You know, what, what do we make of it? And maybe the picture looks like this. So no further information about your particular tumor, but of the, seven, of, of the ones that were in the original, I'm sorry, if you look at a set of other features that yours doesn't have, but that intersects some of the other tumors that are in this study, maybe 40% of those, does that increase now the probability, well, it increases the probability over here. So did your, did your probability just go wrong? So one of the things that's going on in machine learning is there's like this balancing between all of these different kinds of statistical inputs, and you're getting a sort of reconciliation and there are many possible reconciliations of these various statistical inputs. So the question about what does individual risk mean is not new at all. Um, here's a, a, a recent survey that was uh, done by Philip David, who's been studying these things since the early 80s, at least. Um, and. Uh, what does he say? He says, we survey a variety of possible explications of the term individual risk. Uh, 
These in turn are based on a variety of interpretations of probability, including classical enumerative frequency, formal, metaphysical, personal, propensity, chance, and logical conceptions of probability. And he ends up concluding that the concept remains subtle and modestly says that he has some pragmatic suggestions for moving forward. So what do I think? I think that this is um, basically the defining problem of scoring in artificial intelligence. And we heard earlier that we were supposed to use big terms in our, uh, right? So this is the defining problem of the AI era. What does a probability, <laughs> what does an individual probability mean? So uh, I'm not going to say a lot about this, um, but, um, and as I said, this is work in progress. But we're exploring a different take, a, a different approach to it, not in the statistics literature that has its roots in complexity theory. And at a very high level, and I think I do have time for one more slide. So at a very high level, uh, which I'll say a tiny bit more about, it's, it works, uh, we're thinking in terms of an analogy to pseudo-randomness or indistinguishability. And if this general approach is wildly successful, which is an enormous if, um, First of all, the method will explicitly tie what we give as the stated meaning of the individual probability to the limitations of the features and training data that are used in building the scoring function. So what I, uh, uh, something I meant to mention when we had this example with the tumor with the 70% and the 40%, it's this incredibly important point that what you measure matters. And we've heard this over and over again. We heard about this in the context of the child, the Allegheny County algorithm for screening uh, calls for um, uh, abuse and ch child abuse and neglect. That, that the information that's available about a poor child and a poor family is vastly greater than the information that's available about a wealthy family that has access to private insurance, for example, and private drug rehabilitation programs. So we see just immediately, even in that simple example, how the choice of features matters enormously. So what we, we need to do is explicitly state this connection of the limitations of the features and the training data um, that are used in building the function. And also, it will provide some explicit tests for the inadequacy of this pair of features collected, uh, con combined with the training data combination. So um, uh, the starting point for this work is uh, was an effort to bridge this gap between group-based definitions and individual-based definitions. And it's um, multi-calibration, um, work by Eber Johnson, Kim Reingold, and Rothblum. And uh, what they did was they looked at a very large collection of sets. Remember I said, which sets are we going to consider? They looked at a really large collection of sets. In fact, sets that were defined by a computation class, not special judgments about should we include people who like to wear frilly dresses as a category, but rather anything that could be expressible with a very simple computation, let's say, given the data that you have. That's how you are defining the classes. And they create, uh, they show that um, they can ensure something called calibration, and which I'll describe in a second, uh, on each of the sets in these collections simultaneously. So calibration is sort of the sine qua non of forecasting. It says, for example, if you look at all of the days on which the forecaster predicted the night before a 30% chance of rain, then indeed on 30% of those it should have rained. That's calibration. And, and simultaneously, all of the days on which the forecaster pre uh, predicted 70% chance of rain, if you look at all of those, indeed it rained on 70% of those. So what they are ensuring is calibration simultaneously on all of these sets. Now, this does not adjust in any way for past uh, injustices. And, and um, so this is part of a framework of trying to fully 
fully understand and respect your data. And then, in a separate phase, figure out how to adjust for inequities. But at least properly and accurately <coughs> give range to the full expression of what's actually being uh, um, um, rendered for you. And um, then after that, we worked on um, evidence-based, you know, start with that as a starting point, we looked at evidence-based uh, ranking with three of the original authors and Galiona, and um, which defines and avoids certain kinds of ranking evils. So as I said to Evelyn yesterday, we write a, in response to Evelyn's question, we, we, we make a list of evils that we want to rule out, and we make sure that what we build does in fact roll them out. And so that's, that's what we were doing. And it was in the course of that that we came across something that we believe will, will yield, well, it does yield a one-sided and inefficient, for now, test for inadequacy of the data. So it's not a two-way test, and it's not something you could actually compute right now, but information theoretically we can get somewhere. And that's why this, if we are wildly successful, this is what why we are hoping in that direction. Okay, so uh, th these are, are people who were not explicitly cited or whatever, but their work, so the, the ordering on the pictures is essentially chronologically in terms of appearance in the talk and when there are ties sorted alphabetically. <laughs> and that's it. Um, is that, I'm, just, I'm just looking for the question. Oh, we're going out of order. We are, we're going out of, we're going out of order. Uh, Who's the next speaker? Jamie. Oh. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the next time. Read it to me. I think. So in the interest of this being the last section of talks, uh, I suspect this talk will be less than 20 minutes. So maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but uh, I, I feel like we've had a lot of, a lot of presentations this, this week. So. so the thing I want to talk to you today about uh, sort of stems from this idea that uh, in general, when we see machine learning systems, in a way that we don't expect, usually the answer or the, the reason that people give is that we don't fundamentally understand how any particular machine learning system works, why any particular machine learning system makes any particular prediction for a specific case. Um, and that is primarily problematic, and the reason that many of us are interested in that is that there is mounting evidence that the systems we have built in the ecosystems in which they exist, with the historical inequities which exist in society, do not seem to be doing an equally good job predicting outcomes uh, for different types of people, right? Types being very poorly defined. And the thing I want to mention is that we don't totally understand why this is the case. Right? In many cases, I mean, there are specific cases which if you investigate carefully, you might be able to say something about why this is happening. Um, but in general, I think we are woefully in, unable to say 
is this primarily the case because we have chosen a specific algorithm that has some problem? Um, perhaps, you know, this is sort of the, the cop-out answer from my perspective, but like, you know, is this the case because, you know, no matter how we are trying to do this prediction using a machine, using a human, uh, if we are trying to do this kind of prediction, uh, perhaps it's inevitable that, uh, you know, we'll have sort of inherently different accuracy rates for different populations. Um, is this primarily a statistical problem that we have more or less information uh, from a sort of sample complexity sense uh, about one population versus another? And the thing I want to say is that, in general, if we're talking about this field, broadly speaking, uh, and this set of phenomena, broadly speaking, we don't fully understand when and why or when we would expect to see this sort of behavior. Okay? Uh, and I'm saying that as a computer scientist. So I have like epsilon more understanding about how like machine learning systems work than the general population, a uh, member of the general population, although I guess I can't reverse time and think about, anyway. <laughs> okay, so, sorry. So uh, I feel like I've said this in front of a number of you in the last couple of days, but uh, this is regularly brought up, and I think most, I'm saying this provocatively, I don't think that people in this community generally believe this, but uh, I think people regularly ask, well, isn't this just a policy question? Are there not technical answers or meaning, technically meaty questions to answer in this space, right? Isn't this just like someone needs to write a law or write some policy about like the way our algorithm should behave and then we can satisfy that sort of post hoc, right? Um, and I guess the, the point I want to make is that, and people have been making throughout the, the workshop, is that the most effective way to ensure our systems work well, full stop, and then, you know, analogously work well for a broad range of different populations is that we should be thinking about how the systems treat a diverse set of people throughout the design process, right? And that includes thinking about it from a computational lens, okay? Um, and I think when we're thinking about very standard computational tools that we use in all sorts of different uh, domains, uh, thinking about when they may be inadvertently increasing some of the problems we're seeing or introducing some of the problems that we're seeing, um, that can maybe help us start to look at some of the things we might be doing inadvertently to be worsening um, the milieu of problems that society and every other part of the pipeline uh, might be introducing. Okay, so, you know, I'm just sort of hammering this home, not all mistakes are created equal. Um, and you know, even if, you're, if I'm just trying to convince you, uh, you being some of the young computer scientists who haven't decided if this is a space that you're interested in working in, um, I became a scientist because I care about changing the world, right? Uh, and I think a lot of people who call themselves scientists want to change the world. Um, don't we want to understand <laughs> that we understand how we're changing the world? I personally would really like that. Um, and also, if we want uh, not a rejection of the systems we build and you know, revolts against large-scale machine learning systems that we build, I think it's really critical that we get this right. Uh, okay. So the question that I want to think about slightly more precisely is uh, when and why machine learning algorithms treat different demographic groups differently? Uh, and I know that's ill-defined, but... Um, and whether or not it's possible to make them robust to moderate demographic differences. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I made this this morning, uh, and I apologize for, for uh, cribbing from Zach. Um, so I wanted to draw this very generic model of what machine learning looks like. In general, the thought is I have a bunch of samples. I feed them to some algorithm, which gives me a model, which can then label new samples, right? And this is a pretty standard way of thinking about supervised machine learning, right? Most people uh, who, who are giving examples of what machine learning does are talking about supervised learning, right? And just as we were discussing in the last section, um, this scoping is super, super, super narrow, right? So like this is not 
I mean, this is the simplest mathematical formulation of what machine learning does and is, but it is far from a complete picture and probably I, I actually, I somewhat disagree that this is like the most common use of machine learning. I actually think when talking to people in industry, unsupervised tasks are like super, super common. Clustering, uh, dimensionality reduction, which we'll talk about in a moment. All sorts of things where there's not a clear prediction task which is at hand, but like trying to understand <laughs> some latent structure about some big data set and then maybe doing something as a result of that is the far more common case uh, in a lot of these online applications uh, that, that people think about. Um, so I want to zoom out just a bit and recognize that this view of machine learning really ignores even just from the machine learning perspective, not uh, many parts of the pipeline that like machine learning experts develop, not that policymakers develop and not that historical inequities sort of imbibe into the system. Okay. So the thing I want to briefly talk about today um, is what's called high dimensional data mining. Okay. So how many people uh, if I say dimensionality reduction, how many people in the room know what that is? <laughs> okay, so that's more or less consistent with what I thought. Okay, good. Uh, consistent in that every, every, every computer scientist that I recognized raised their hand. Okay, um, and <laughs> I don't think any of the non-computer scientists that I knew raised their hands. Uh, and I apologize for those of you who I don't know. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. But, but actually, Joan, you're getting a call out because uh, you mentioned the precise form of dimensionality reduction that I'm going to talk a little bit about in your talk. Uh, and you made two points that I think are super critical. One of which is like people regularly run PCA before doing anything else, which, you know, when I say what this means in a minute, like that, that's important. I think the point is that in lots of healthcare and medical applications, there's some pre-processing that happens well before the picture I had on the previous slide that happens without thinking, okay? <laughs> and the second point she made was that differences inside of a group are often much greater than differences between different groups. Okay? So if you're thinking about that geometrically, right, the space of people who belong to one demographic group is often much broader in all the directions than like the space, if you're imagining these groups being disjoint, the space between two different groups, if that geometric interpretation is helpful. Okay? So I'll tell you what high dimensional data mining is. Uh, okay, so in general, a data set, you know, in, in a very abstract sense, is just thought of as like a bunch of examples, right? We can think of them as uh, representations of, of patients or people, uh, and then a whole bunch of pieces of information that I have about those individuals, right? Um, and I'm trying to make this a very, uh, imagine having, you know, 10,000 people, but many, many, many more uh, pieces of information about them. Okay, so maybe we haven't yet abolished population genetics and I have like every, uh, an indicator vector for every single gene in the human genome. Uh, and we're trying to, from that, you know, we, we have this high dimensional data set. We're sort of interested in like what we can learn from it. And we're not trying to like do some prediction task. We just have a huge, huge, huge data set and we want to know something about it. Okay. So a pretty standard first thing to do, first uh, being some caveat, is to come up with something. So the important point about this is that there's a skinny matrix and a narrow matrix, right? So to come up with something which is much smaller, right? Like this times this, it doesn't look so on this, on this, uh, on this particular slide, but the amount of space necessary to write down M this original data set and just like one row of numbers and another row of numbers is, you know, this is going to take up way, way, way less space. Okay? So like take a huge data set that lives in really high dimensional space and find a really low dimensional representation of that data. Okay? So there are many reasons to do this, but this is a pretty standard pre-processing te uh, technique for all sorts of different application domains. Okay? Um, and these are usually called low dimensional representations. And the reason people often want to do this, there are mostly technical reasons. Um, although the first one, which I think is really critical, is that people often like low dimensional representations of their otherwise ginormous data sets because humans are super bad at thinking about anything beyond like three dimensions, right? We can visualize three dimensions 
And if you like try to visualize what like a 20 dimensional space is, we don't, our eyes live in, well, I don't know how you count dimensions, but like three depth dimensions, okay? So if you want to visualize a data set that lives in 10,000 dimensions, it's very helpful to map it onto three dimensions, okay? Um, for that reason, when people are trying to understand if there's some meaningful trend uh, in a data set that they're looking at, and they don't know what they're looking for, and they just want to literally look at it, <laughs> uh, one thing that's common is to project down into a very small, maybe one or two dimensions, and try to understand what they see there, right? Um, this is also useful for the reason I mentioned before, right? A data set takes much less space up if you only write down 10 numbers about it than 10,000. Um, and also it gets rid of some nasty statistical questions, uh, some statistical problems that you might have uh, if you don't do this, okay? So, uh, right, okay. So, I think this is really, really common, uh, and and you know, I, I did appreciate that Joan like specifically called out a certain kind of uh, low dimensional representation finding in her talk that she sort of took for granted, right? PCA, if that if that's a word that uh, is something you know, um, but it's very common to use some kind of low dimensional representation of a high dimensional data set as pre processing when doing all sorts of things with the data set. Um, and I think it's important that we think about that choice. The, the one takeaway is I think we should t think about every choice, but this choice is perhaps a problematic choice if your data set actually does represent a bunch of people who, for example, may be male and female, right? The reason being, if I take a data set that lives in 10,000 dimensions and I write it down in 10 dimensions, one of the things I said was that saves a bunch of space, right? It's like. I can write it on a much smaller hard drive than if I was writing down every single number. But in so doing, if I'm taking up less space, I necessarily have less information about the people in that data set, right? Or at least conceivably I have, right? I can write more things down on a big hard drive than a, than a thumb drive. Um, and the question is that I would like to ask is whether when I do that, uh, projection into a much smaller space-saving representation, do I lose more information about one of my populations than another? Right? Uh, and I think this is, again, sorry to call Joan out again, critically important um, because lots of the ways people tend to represent data sets in lower dimensions care about sort of how much difference there is between the points in the data set in the lower dimensional representation. And if there's much more difference between different women than there are between women and men, this could be hugely problematic, right? If we, if we do, in fact, lose much more information about one subgroup than another. Okay, so I just wanna say, uh, so, so one such technique for this is PCA. Um, and if you run PCA on a pretty standard data set, right? So uh, a vision data set that has a whole bunch of images of, uh, famous, beautiful people, uh, <laughs> um, apologies for that. Uh, if you run PCA on it, in general what we found was that you have roughly 10% higher reconstruction error uh, on male faces, uh, other direction, female faces than male faces. Uh, I've given this talk before, I can't believe I didn't. Okay, so, so what this means is if you have some high dimensional data set like images, and you project images of faces, you project that down onto say three or five dimensions, you've already lost some more information about one of these groups than another. And that could be pretty problematic, right? If we're thinking about this as like a pre-processing step before we find like interesting patterns upon which we do like medical studies. Um, right, so, um, it's also the case that like you know, one one solution to this is okay if you have a bunch of data, some of which belongs to men, uh, belongs to like a male population and some of which belongs to a female population. Maybe the right thing to do is just treat them totally separately, right? Um, and there are a variety of cases in which you might want to do that, right? If you're looking at certain kinds of things that you do believe there's, you know, if you have a specific task in mind, that may be appropriate. Um, but there are other cases in which 
you wouldn't want to do that, right? It may be the case that you have a huge amount of additional demographic information on this sort of data set you're doing exploratory data analysis on, but then you're going to like do a whole bunch of other things and then later down the line you'll have a lot of that information remaining but you don't have the demographic information, right? You maybe don't have whether certain patients are male or female at some point down the line when you're also trying to use the same projection, okay? Um, so, you know, that a, a simple solution in general is to do everything separately and just like let the entire pipelines be separate for like all of our different groups, but there are lots of reasons you might not want to do that, okay? So uh, this is totally unreadable. Okay, so uh, that's all right. Um, this is a pretty picture on my, uh, anyway, so this is just saying we have like representations of the data sets restricted to um, men and women. Um, and we're sort of thinking of those in high dimensional space. Um, and the primary takeaway from this work from a technical perspective, not from sort of a, a, a more meaningful societal one, is that it's possible to find these low, like, low dimensional representations of data sets in a computational sense uh, that are doing sort of as well as you could hope for both groups simultaneously. Okay, so we're gonna lose some information about both populations, but we're going to be able in a computational sense to lose the same amount of information, right? Which wouldn't happen for free, um, just doing standard, standard things, right? So uh, you don't need to parse this, but that's what this is saying. Uh, Cynthia, it looked like you have a question? No, okay. Okay, okay so that's uh, the last technical slide. Um, and I, Oh no, I just, it, you know, it's off, off the topic, but there's this uh, uh, definition, Love. right, in some recent paper on reconstruction as a privacy measure, and then they show that if you're, uh, if you had very low priors on the data, and you use sort of, a, I think, a French priors with a big error parameter, I mean, allowing a lot of la la loss of privacy, you cannot reconstruct as long as there is uh, low priors. So, in, in other words, this thing about losing information about women, Good side right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you lose more information, you get more privacy. Right, no, so they make it sort of rigorous. There's some, mm -hmm. some condition on the prior. Right. I, I don't know precisely the, the paper you're talking about, but I'd be interested to hear more about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I just want to uh, have uh, this as the takeaway slide, right? I think it's really important that we think about why our machine learning methods do treat different demographic groups so differently, um, and to try to make them as robust as possible, uh, which often means thinking beyond just like the supervised learning, like are we doing sort of similarly in terms of prediction rates for this very specific prediction task um, for different demographic groups. Um, and this really requires thinking about somehow there is supposed to be another here, uh, that we're supposed to, we really need to think about the entire process by which we are coming to our scientific conclusions, uh, machine learning and otherwise, uh, not just thinking about supervised learning. Great. <laughs> Bonus slide. Our next speaker is Duana Fulwiley. <laughs>